coming up this week on Success Won't Come Calling. We had a situation where, uh, thinking back to the last Euros, about 15 minutes into uh, the game on a Sunday afternoon, I'd had a couple of drinks and a customer call. They'd experienced their whole system being locked down. And it wasn't just about them needing our, our help throughout the situation. They, they were actually faced with whether or not their firm would survive or not. They were being asked for a significant sum of money. And they called us for some advice on things. And it wasn't about, right, you've called me and interrupted me. It was more about, right, we're going to get together and help you. You need to give me a couple hours because I need to get my technical directors who were also had a few drinks as well at that particular point. You need to give me an hour or two to, to gather everybody and let's figure out a bit of a plan of attack here. Hello, friends. Simon Gibson here. Welcome to SWCC. If you like the podcast, please click subscribe and you'll know whenever one of our episodes lands. Today, we are talking tech with Jonathan Ashley, who's the founder of ETI Cloud. What ETI Cloud do is they protect businesses against hacking, data theft, and fraud, as well as providing safe remote working environments for businesses and teams. Jonathan's got loads of really interesting experience about how to stop hacks, how to cure hacks, and what the tech of the future might look like for those wanting to infiltrate businesses. So on that basis, sit back, relax, hope you enjoy this episode with me, Simon Gibson, and my guest, Jonathan Ashley. Jonathan, thank you so much for doing this. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks, Simon, for having me. Not at all. So let's let I've just done my best to describe what ETI Cloud do, but you you take it from the top. Uh, obviously, you're the founder of the business. You've mm-hmm. been there since the get go. So tell us uh, tell us what ETI Cloud uh, does. Um, so thank thanks, Simon. Um, predominantly, what we're doing is we're making it easier for businesses to operate in this day and age. So we've all just come through uh, through the pandemic or, or most of the way through it. Um, and effectively, one of the things that came out of that was being able to work more effectively from home or anywhere at any time, really, is, is sort of how we how we coin it. To do that, it's quite... Um, uh, quite technical. Uh, we need to provide a lot of security behind the scenes as well, and make sure we're keeping people safe in this this day and age. Um, so effectively, we we build systems that underpin our customers' environments, store a lot of their data for them, and really allow them to operate and function on an everyday basis wherever they would like to within their office or or working uh, working from home and that sort of thing. And when you mentioned COVID, mm. when that struck, I mean it's it's almost difficult to think back from a business perspective on how things used to be. We all used to go in the office every day in suits and and all the rest of it. But did you foresee at the outset that this situation now would develop where home working, hybrid working, flexible working is is almost just a given that businesses must provide it? Did did you did you see that as as a likely outcome? Um we we knew that there was a requirement out there, given the transportation issues, particularly within the UK, um, given people wanting to have more flexible working, uh, again, a bit more uh, work, work-life balance. Um, so all of that was out there, but it was it predominantly reserved for certain staff. Um, I suppose nobody foresaw, foresaw that uh, effectively everybody would be put into that category uh, and and be able to to work from home. And I suppose the interesting thing now is um, it's almost come full circle in the sense that um, you know we we uh, earlier on today I was in it was in a business we walked in and it was an empty empty office couple of couple of people in generally it's a lot busier on Fridays and Mondays but today when we walked in very few people most people are working from home um, and it, it just works for that business and it's almost uh, almost turned the business continuity strategy on its head that if you can't work from home for any particular reason there's an office space for people to go into and work and from our perspective um, the support the support we provide, Really doesn't matter where they are. It, it's uh, they open up their uh, their their, their desktop uh, solution we provide for them, and they're in their business environment, their virtual business environment, where they have all the tools uh, to to help them function as a business. And and I suppose um, for us, it's been key the whole way through. Um, you know, yes, when we delivered these types of solutions prior to COVID, it was all about having that experience for a smaller number of staff. Um, but we uh, we found out very very quickly that um, you know we were obviously onto something that was very popular during the uh, 
uh, during the time where everyone was working from home. And uh, as a result of that, um, yeah, I think I think hybrid working is sort of here here to stay. Yeah, no, here. absolutely. I mean, I was interested in what you said there about this business continuity plan being turned on its head. I think that's got two sides to it because on the one hand, systematically, I completely get why if the majority are working from home, the the office environment provides your plan B. And who, mm. who would have thought that we'd be saying that? Yeah. But also, of course, what you need to continue with the business sustainably is, is employees. That's right. And I just wonder in this day and age, if there's a, a business which is predominantly historically been office based, if they don't have an agile and secure working environment, well, the disastrous the disaster recovery plan isn't the only thing they should be worrying about. It's their ability to recruit and retain good people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and that's something we're finding. Um, even ourselves, as we went through the uh, through the last couple of years, recruitment was a was a massive issue for 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 companies in IT, um, because quite frankly, we were all looking for extra staff to help support some of the challenges our customers were facing. Um, we, uh, we, 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 we sort of joked that some of our staff, we, uh, we hadn't met until post COVID when they actually came in and we, we had them in the office. So it's, uh, it's, it's been really interesting, but you're, but you're right. That whole employment pool has, uh, has massively grown. And it means that the talent that, that we're all trying to, uh, un- uncover and, uh, and have come work for us is, uh, is much further afield these days. And I, I, I suppose, uh, it makes you work a lot harder as a firm as well to make sure that you are retaining that staff. And so it, it does does change the way people do things from an HR perspective as well. So it's uh, certainly certainly interesting times and sort of turned traditional business uh, on, on its head a little bit. So. It, it has. And I mean, we're in the, in the Spiring Group, we're, we're viewing it really positively insofar mm. as, it's, it, again, it's incredible to think this way that only a short period ago, you, you, your recruitment strategy was based upon people who lived in, what, a 10-mile radius or something like that, whereas, yeah. you know, we've literally now got people working all over the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and without that level of security, because you mentioned earlier, it's not just about, is it about facilitating Correct. things yeah. like connectivity and obviously... Um, sustainability of 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 um, access to systems and that sort of thing it's actually about protection of of data mm. and i mean that's such a key area for all businesses now in these days of um gdpr and um all of these dreadful hacks and fraud that we hear about yeah how serious is a, a part of your business is it to make sure that not only can people work remotely and flexibly and, and and safely, but they can work in a way where data and confidentiality are preserved. Yeah, it, it's it's massively important to our business, and it's um, it, it's something that uh, um, you know is, is fundamental to the core of what we do, and that is the first you know the, the first sort of pillar of what we provide. Um, what is interesting is is the the level of education. Uh, some of our customers, businesses we work with, uh, businesses in the marketplace um, have had to go through in terms of getting staff to understand um, how to operate while outside of the office. Because, of course, when we're all in an office environment, you you know, we, we all know how to conduct ourselves. Um, moving to different working conditions, we all operated slightly differently. I'm sure um, you, you may have seen on LinkedIn when... Um, uh, when the pandemic first struck, there was lots of people say, I'm, I'm now working from home. And they'd have a picture of a desk with files <laughs> laid all over it. And you're going... <laughs> Clients' names yeah, everywhere. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Addresses. <laughs> and so, so those were quickly taken down yeah. by various, various different senior individuals in those firms. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but yeah, so, so it is core to, to the business. But what I would say is, is um, it's interesting because if you go back to sort of 2017, 2018, pre, pre-pandemic, um, the, the main industry we, we, uh, we, we, sort of, we sort of work in is uh, professional services and specifically legal. Um, and there were reports being put out by the, uh, the National Cybersecurity Center then to the Law Society that were suggesting that, you know, nearly half of all firms had experienced some sort of a breach within, uh, within the p- particular period that they did report through. You would expect that that would have now changed and improved as a result of information. But what you're finding is, is um, 
I think things are just getting a little bit more sophisticated. Um, potentially, people aren't learning as quickly as they should. Um, senior level buy-in to how they should be helping train some of their staff to look for things is potentially not being uh, taken up as as um, as quickly as it should. Um, so, so there is a lot of work to do around it, and there's there's certain things we can do to keep the environment really, really secure. But it's um, it's a partnership in it with with ourselves and our customers to to ensure that that uh, strength is there, and I think it's um, it, it's one of those things that uh, the same way that we have physical security on a on a building, um, you know, and and people would wouldn't walk out the door without locking it or without switching the lights off and putting the alarm system on. It's it's the same sort of idea. There's do's and don'ts that I think everybody's now starting to to pick up, um, and it's it's about really um, people taking personal responsibility inside that corporate group um, to, to ensure that they're looking after their their own personal side of the side of uh, um, the services that they're using but also the greater uh, corporate side of things as well yeah I mean it's interesting you've just talked about the do's and don'ts it'd be just fun to get into some of those but first of all the point you made on the 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 the, the uh, people, the criminals who are trying to breach security, they're trying to steal data, they're trying to steal money, they're trying to get funds redirected to other accounts and all these, you know, these stories we hear which make your blood turn cold. They are becoming a f- a increasingly sophisticated. I mean, we, mm-hmm. we hear of this all the time. Um, in your experience, do, do you feel that the, the technology that protects businesses against these sort of hacks is moving as quickly as the uh, innovation and the ingenuity mm. of those trying to uh, commit the hacks? Yeah, I, I think, uh, to be honest, I suppose the biggest challenge we have is um, uh, there's an assumption that security costs more money. And that's an incorrect assumption. It's it's basically how you. Um, it's a little bit a little bit like building a house. Um, you you know you can build a house correctly or incorrectly, um, depending on how you go about building it. But you still use the same sorts of supplies to build that house. Um, and so so from our experience, um, we we build our system in a certain way that makes it extremely secure, um, but doesn't cost anything. You know, over and above what you would normally pay for a, for a solution like ours um, through through anyone else. So it's it's more about um, how that's constructed and how it's put together as to how strong that that actual system is. So I think um, you know there, there's some fundamental um, ways that um, most companies are being compromised if they if they do experience a um, a breach. It tends to be things like email, tends to be things like phishing emails where they've opened an attachment, yeah. put their details in. And, and they're, they're fairly lower level um, hacks still. Um, and what that does is it opens the door to allow people inside. And it just depends on how, the, the, the level of um, strength within, within that system as to how far that person then gets within the system. And we spend a lot of time and effort to make sure that 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 they even if they were able to get in they wouldn't be able to get very far yeah um, and and we have things like um, uh, you know uh, if somebody were to get through their that you know one of our customers systems they have absolutely no access to the backups that we take of that system which means that there's absolutely no way of being able to lock up the front end of the system and the back end of the system so there's always a fail safe for it so it's just how you go about building it that that makes it unique but I think um, the 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 security is out there to keep up with the criminal uh, environment. I think the challenge is, is it's building that trust in the marketplace and building that awareness in the marketplace so that people actually respect the fact that when we are talking about security, we're not just doing it for the sake of trying to make a sale. Sure. We're doing it from the standpoint that we actually care about what we do and we care about the customers we work with. And, um, you know, we we, uh, we put a lot of time and effort into the way that we do things and a lot I'm of care just, and attention. Ju- just on that, sorry to cut off, I'm really interested what you're saying there about the level of care because that, that comes across. To what extent are you having to sort of think ahead in terms of what the next scam might be, what the next hack might be. Because you use, for example, this um, limitation that you put in place that even if someone can get sort of into the system, they can't get to the backups. Are um, are, are the fraudsters out there who are trying to think of, of ways around that? Yeah, but but I think you've got, 
um, it, it's it's a little bit like um, I suppose in in some ways um, the uh, you know they look at it almost as a marketplace where they make yeah. billions of pounds a year um, trying to uh, extract money from businesses that haven't necessarily protected themselves properly. Um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't dare go on to say that they're lazy at what they do, but what they like to try and do is try to try and put a blended approach across and effectively try and send a lot of phishing emails to various different places to uncover the easy, vulnerable um, companies out there, the soft soft underbelly, I suppose, of things where they don't necessarily have to work too hard to get to get to where they need to. Because, um, you know, ultimately, if they find that um, they can compromise uh, someone's um, uh, email system and get inside, generally speaking, because that's slightly weaker, or that someone's not necessarily had the training, the thought process is, is then that as I get in, I can go deeper into the system and do what I need to do. So the, the prioritization the sophistication of hacks is, is not, you know, is is not necessarily um, they're they're not as sophisticated um, on the day to day basis. That we're seeing things. I think where you're seeing more political or more um, uh, you know specific focused hacks, I think those are quite quite sinister and, and take a very long time to do. Where they're actually going after more political gain um, or specific financial gain against certain companies. You know, th that's a completely different story. What we typically are faced with, most of our customers, are just the bombardment of information going out to the end users, and unfortunately, having some of those end users users who um, don't don't have the right education, um, or the messaging isn't strong enough throughout the organization to you know to want to ensure that that protection is there on an individual basis. So they're after the quick wins, aren't they? They're, they're prioritizing yeah. those yeah. which they don't maybe have to invest so much time in. Because I mean, one example. Um, that I remember I heard of a while ago is you get very small businesses, often quite traditional businesses, perhaps quite old school in their approach, who handle lots of money. Yeah, they handle lots of client money. I mean, the the, the, the example that I um, came across a little, little while ago was it was actually a small law firm who was dealing with commercial property mm -hmm. type transactions. So they were a very modest outfit but mm -hmm. good reputation. Yep. They're getting good work from developers. And they were dealing with completions where they had millions of pounds in their client account yeah. that they were sending. This example I saw was someone managed to hack a client's yep. email account, email them and said, can you send it to a different bank account? We changed accounts. Yeah. They did it. And of course, 10 yeah. minutes later, the account was cleared, shut down, and the business failed because mm. of that, mm. because there was all sorts of arguments about whether they were covered with professional indemnity insurance and yeah. all that sort of thing. So it seems to me that perhaps the most vulnerable ones, vulnerable businesses, are those who are almost thinking, oh, we don't need systems. We don't, we're not absolutely. like that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it, business, is, <laughs> business is changing as well. I think um, uh, if you look at the way that we have used and relied on email for the last sort of 20 years, um, it's now becoming a place where um, you know there are there's concerns every time I get an email we're we're having to think or I think I don't know about yourself am I do, do I know who this is coming from should I be opening this is there an attachment with it that I want to open or not um, you know who, who's who's ultimately sent it to me and and I think you know one of the one of the things that um, we've now seen in terms of talking about trying to stay one step ahead um, is about looking at things uh, things like portals. So one of the challenges is where um, you know if a conveyance is going through and they're dealing with a client who might have an iCloud account or a Hotmail account and maybe they don't have the experience of um, making sure the emails are secure and things their you know their information could have been hacked. Um, so therefore, it's putting the onus actually on the corporate um, corporate firm um, and, and uh, that the firm itself isn't aware whether or not the information is accurate that they're getting, but it looks and feels familiar um, and in terms of the tone and, and uh, conversation they would normally have with the client. But if you enter into the mix, sort of a portal-based system where people are actually communicating in a secure portal, um, 
there is a two-step process to get into it. There might be an email that's sent. We've all had things from our banks or things from some of the couriers, that sort of thing, where you click on a link, you need a PIN for your phone. So it's a two-factor authentication to get in. And then all my documents are electronically controlled in, in that particular environment. I can sign things, pay for things inside that, uh, that, that portal. And I think it's just things like that that make it more secure. So I suppose we're constantly going out and trying to lobby our customers to understand um, what they're doing for their business. So yes, we provide sort of an underpinning of all of their security, but then we're also trying to understand how they are conducting themselves as a business, getting into the almost the business solution and the business strategy side of things with them um, so that we can help them and, and make them aware of some of the things, some of the trends that are that are coming into place to, to help firms. So. I, can, I can understand what you mean there because yeah. presumably – there's only so far systems can go if the people operating those systems yeah. aren't kind of switched on. I mean, just to go back to the property example of account details getting changed last minute, it's from a genuine email mm. account. It's about the person, isn't it? Just thinking, something's just not quite right. There. I'm going to pick the phone up yeah. and just double check this all makes sense and yeah, there being an actual protocol in place. Yeah. Uh, so you get involved in that side as well, that kind of advising side? Yeah, we... Um I think it's it's one of those things. We we uh, the, the relationships we have with our customers um, are really um, you know we uh, once once we go through the original um, setting up of the full system and making sure people can access it and use it, um, it's it's really about having regular um, uh, information sessions with our with our customers, um, whether it be some of the senior management, whether it be um, specific people uh, you know that, that are using the solutions, um, and really trying to talk to them and find out um, you know what they're using it for, what challenges they're having, concerns they might have. Um, we also have uh, a lot of uh, again we mentioned that we're sort of specialists in the legal sector, so we have over two hundred legal clients, that means that if I've had, if I've seen it at one client, I'm potentially going to see that again at, at other similar, similar firms that have similar focus points. Um, so we can make them aware of things, obviously with, from, from a confidential nature, but we can make them aware of things that we're seeing in the marketplace and adjustments they might want to make to things. And, and uh, we, we, um, we find that that's, um, that's actually the bit that makes it quite a, um, you know, quite a nice process. And, and you're, you're, you're seen as more of a, a partner, a strategic partner in the process, as opposed to just a supplier customer style relationship. And that's the, that's the preference from our side is it makes it, you know, it, it, it makes you get out of bed in the morning when you know you're having good relationships with, with, uh, with your customers, as opposed to just sort of on a supply sort of basis with firms. I'm, you know, I'm sure you know what I mean, but. Uh, oh, I do. And yeah. I mean, that, that issue of partnership, I mean, that's got to apply, hasn't it, to this area because yeah. of this issue that the technology is evolving, the hacks are evolving, mm. people's behaviours are evolving, the workplace is evolving. So it's not just like an off-the-shelf solution where exactly. you can just buy it and then not never worry about it again. Mm. Exactly, exactly. And it's, um, I mean, we spend, a, we spend a lot of time and effort on it. Um, you know, things like um, we've become partners with the Law Society, for example, and one of the main drivers behind that was to try and ensure we were pushing um, education and, and articles and things out to the membership, um, not just about, you know, hey, come and talk to us for ETI, we want to, you know, we want to put something in place. It was more about, are, are you really getting the most from your technology partners? And if you're not, these are some of the questions you need to be asking. Um, you know, are you looking at new some of the new technology advancements because you should be looking at some of these things because um, um, this this is the trends of portals, for example, and self serve onboarding and all. I won't bore you with all the all the all the technical bits, but um, just just ways and means um, for for firms to manage their businesses in a more um, efficient way, but more securely yeah. as well yeah. to protect protect against loss and, and all of those sorts of things. So. Because, I mean, it, it, this if, if, if a business gets this wrong, mm -hmm. it can shut them down, can't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we, we had a situation where, uh, thinking back to the last Euros, where, where England was doing uh, quite well, I think it was their fourth game in the, uh, in the series, um, in, in, the, in the first sort of round-robin uh, group, um, about 15 minutes into... Uh, uh, in, into uh, to the game on a Sunday afternoon. I think we were all allowed to to mix at that point, or thirty of us were allowed to mix. So I was wasn't breaking any regulations. I, I assure you. Um, but I'd had a couple of couple of drinks, and a uh, customer called, and we we always go with the approach that every one of our customers has uh, has all of our directors' telephone numbers, and if you've got an issue, give us a shout. So mine was ringing, and I looked at it and looked at it twice again, and thought. 
Do they not realise England game was on at this particular <laughs> Obviously point? Obviously not football fan. <laughs> and I, and I thought, you know what, I, I, I need to do the right thing here. So I excused myself from the, from the small group we had and went outside and, uh, and, and, uh, and gave the chap a quick call. And, and he says, look, I know the game's on and I apologise for calling, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call otherwise um, and, and interrupt you. Uh, and they'd experienced their whole system being locked down. Um, and they were uh, they, they had they had had this on a on a Friday. We did a little bit of work with them. We used to provide their uh, their telephone system for them at that particular point, and we were doing a few special projects with them. Um, their whole system had been locked down, and it wasn't just about them needing our our help throughout the situation. They, they were actually faced with whether or not their firm would survive or not. They were being asked for a significant sum of money. Oh, is this to this unlock the data? What's it, what do you call? Is this is this this isn't malware, is it, or ransomware? Um, it, it, it was. Uh, it was effectively um, uh, they'd locked down the entire system for. So unless you, know, you give me this money, your system. That's right. Down. So they couldn't access their databases and either software. The entire thing was uh, was, was locked to their IT company, their third party IT that they would work with, um, and they called us for some advice on things. And they'd spoken to their insurance company um, about uh, getting help and assistance from them. They had a third party company they were doing some work with, and, and really what they come up with was it was either going to be um, not necessarily support and pay any sort of fee, although that was. That would have obviously been one of the options on the table. Um, uh, but the likelihood is it was going to take them at least three weeks to get back up and running. And, and you know the, the mm. legal, legal sector as well. Or as any, I business, do. any business. Any business takes you for three weeks. And, that could be survive or not. That's right. And the, the you know, so so the so the the cash flow of the business at that particular point, it, it would have it would have absolutely taken them to the brink. Um so we we managed to we managed to work with them and uh, and get them back up and running. Um, we there was some luck on our side. They'd uh, they'd taken a clean backup elsewhere and, and put that um, just from some old processes they had that they had, uh, um, I, I think, predominantly forgotten that they actually had. But as we went through the conversation, they went actually. Do you know what? We've got that. We had been doing some work with them on a on a separate project on email at the time so we had uh, some control of their email at the at the time um and we were uh, we were able to sort of work with them and and it wasn't about right you've called me and interrupted me um right how big's your checkbook um it was more about right we're, we're gonna we're gonna get together and help you. You need to give me a couple hours because I need to get my technical directors who are also had a few drinks as well at that particular point. You need to give me an hour or two to to gather everybody and let's figure out a bit of a plan of attack here. And um, and we were able to get them back up and running in about forty eight hours as the main system. Um, but the biggest problem was they had to then bring in all these laptops and have all the, the staff laptops wiped clean um, so they could then redistribute them to their staff and then get them back up back up and running. So, um, you know, when we talk about businesses going to the brink and potentially failing as a result of um, some of this criminal activity, you know, it, it's it's serious. And, uh, you know, it's um, it's becoming far too common, I think, as well. Um, and, and the unfortunate bit is... Um, there are companies like ETI. We have many, you know, we, we have a, a number of, of competitors, um, and uh, we, we would certainly tell you that, you know, hey, we're 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 we're, we're pretty good. Um, our competitors are also re- reasonable as well. Um, but uh, you don't have to say that on here, you know. Yeah, well, absolutely that's right, that's shit. Right. The competitors are shit. <laughs> but but what, what I would say is, is we all have the customers, you know, um, yeah, yeah. you know, customers back with this, and that there's some really really easy things we can put in place to make sure this doesn't happen. And it's just a a lack of of, um, I suppose being thorough and, and reviewing it regularly yeah. um, that, that had, had happened and, and left them sort of prone to uh, to attack. Um, so so yeah so so genuinely I mean um, you know this this is uh, businesses uh, potentially failing in a lot of cases um, if if they don't have the right protection in place. So if I mean so. it's 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 almost pointless building a good business. Mm. If you're not prepared to make this investment, because yeah. one of these frauds could just turn your lights out. Yeah, well, it's it's now a foundation of the business. I mean, you know, we we talk about bricks and mortar. We used to used to all have our offices we went to every day. It's it's now that virtual foundation that you have to build the business on. Um, and there's and there's plenty of different ways to do that. But the point is, is to be having those conversations with the right people um, to to ensure that that foundation is built for you. And then don't just take their word for it. 
challenge them on it and let, mm-hmm. you know, let's go through a series of, you know, uh, what's in place and does it meet our corporate policy that we have for from a security perspective? Does it meet our insurance companies? Um, you know, uh, c- corporate uh, requirements uh, that they place on us, and, and and make sure that the checks and balances are in place, and that that everybody is uh, is above board and, and, and works together. I mean, one of the one of the big things we've started to do is a a business continuity agreement that we put put together, and we both sort of go through, and it's uh, it's just making sure simple things like um, you know, we have all the right contact details for everybody, so they you know the, our customer has ours, and and we have theirs, and they're up to date and current because. You know, somebody may have left the business. Or, yeah, you, you got to be careful of that, haven't you? Yeah, and, and and a lot of a lot of business owners will will say to us, "Look, I want to be the first one that's called," and yet, unless we unless we have that on the actual document, we're calling sort of middle management staff potentially sometimes when when the actual owners of the business say, "Look, I actually want to hear about it because I'm, I'm yeah. you know I'm really interested in making sure that we're as secure as possible." So well, it seems sensible. So, so the buck stops with me. Call me. Yeah, um, and completely. I can make some decisions for my organization with help from internally. But uh, so, so it's about it's about the planning of of things and making sure that um, um, people are investigating it. I think more instead of just sort of saying, "Well, you know, we'll we'll just get on with it and do yeah. things the way we've always done it." Yeah. One of the things you were, um, one of the points you were making before was about this sort of values driven approach you have mm-hmm. to the business that you're not necessarily just thinking about a quick sale. Mm-hmm. You're thinking about your, the actual customer. What, what, what underpins that? Cause I guess a cynic who's listening to this might think, Oh, come on, pull the other one. Your, your <laughs> view, you might well be looking long-term, but you're viewing this as a long-term profitable relationship. Yeah. I mean, how do you balance as a, the founder of this business uh, with this, uh, with the need to make a decent profit, that's that's why you're yeah. in business. Yeah. Um, with this your genuine desire you've got to to help people in this area, mm. which could be um, life or death for their business. Yeah, it's quite frankly, it comes down to the business model that we've uh, we've built. Um, I used to be with a. Um, uh, another much, much, much larger managed service provider uh, a number of years ago, and uh, was in charge of was was their head of business development at the time. We had amalgamated a, a we brought in a lot of uh, businesses we'd acquired. Um, we had built some really great marketing documents that said we were able to do all these things, and they're all intertwined, and they would all work together properly. Um, and uh, so much so that as a business development team, we we believed all of that, and we would you know we would be able to put some you know really cracking solutions together for our customers. Um, the challenge was when you tried to get what was in essence siloed businesses to try and work together to deliver these services. They they didn't always always work that well, and what what that did is it um, left a you know um, a poor taste in the, in the customer's mouth in terms of um, you know uh, they, they weren't necessarily getting what they originally were, were paying for. So so the relationship immediately you know that you'd worked so long to build was uh, was in tatters, and you then wanted to try and build that relationship over time, and uh, um, there were service challenges and things with it. Um, what that meant is that at the end of the the agreement, typically they were leaving and going elsewhere. You'd not had any exp- any uh, ability to to provide them with any other solutions and services. Uh, so it meant we were then putting stuff in the top of the funnel to try and keep the business at a at a certain level. And 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 one day I was uh, I was having a chat with um uh with with, with a, a, a few of my mates, quite frankly, uh, about. Wouldn't it be great if you could build a model where you could just service your customers? They would they would want to stay with you longer. They would want to find out what other services you were able to provide that were fit for purpose for their business. Um, you would then have multiple contracts with them. They would then tell people how good we are because they would enjoy the experience of working together. We could use them as reference points to then tell other people, you know, give them evidence of how how good we are to, to come on board with us. And and really, it was about. That, that ability to provide a really high level of customer satisfaction, which drove the initial ethos of the business. And um, so, so I suppose, you know, it may sound like lip service and you're absolutely right. The cynic would say, well, yeah, everybody says that. But um, we consistently have customers who sign multiple contracts with us and and take um, additional services from us. Um, one, because the services 
they they require because it's part of their business. Again, we know exactly what their businesses do, and we work with a lot of similar businesses, so we're able to to put some of those services into them. But secondly, the more services we are providing, the more holistic view we have of of their business, and and more we can help them uh, to to ensure the strategies where it should be protect them um, across more of their business in terms of. Um, uh, not just the virtual experience, but also some of the physical experience, the internet connections, the telephone yeah. solutions, all of that, all of that sort of stuff. So, and was so, it just, just, just to ask you? Sorry, to yeah. what it was interesting. You made that comparison between your previous business, which was sounds like it was quite a large yeah. corporate, and when you, you you founded ETI Cloud, is there an element there of of the when when a business gets to a certain size? Do you think whatever it does? they simply have to focus on only the bottom line because there's this model of perpetual growth and it's all sales driven and we've got shareholders to satisfy. Do you think when you've founded something that's your own, you can afford to bring in more of an ethics and values driven strategy? Yeah, well, I think I think it's important to, uh, to, to ensure that we're true to our customers. And, um, you know, so... so we have we have a very um, achievable model. Um, we, you know, as 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 we as we say to our customers that that, that discuss price and things like that with us. If if you are a company that has two or three employees, or your company that has a thousand employees, generally speaking, they are they are all paying the same amount of money for the services we're receiving on a seat by seat basis. So so we build our pricing structures based on an individual requirement, so um, so that it's uh, it, it's easier for us to maintain that. Um, service level of, of all, everything that goes into that. So the same security levels. So you, if you think about um, you know, the, the the way that in some cases, particularly with smaller business, it's it's often quite challenging for them to have a an enterprise grade um, security system. Well, in our world, it's not because if you're a large enterprise or or you're a very small business, you are you're both getting um, a, you know an enterprise grade solution from us because we are building that and we are providing that on an individual level, um, based on the requirements that of that particular customer. Um, and and I think you know. That allows us to sort of ensure that we are replicating um, the the solution that everyone's God, receiving. So you can just you can just scale it once, yeah, it's, once it's there. Yeah. And, and then we just and then from the from the from the flip side of it, we then make make sure that we have the account management structure in place and the project team in place and everything else. So we so we are not running short of individuals to service our clients. Um, yeah. And and that's not to say we get it perfect all the time. I mean, you know, you, you business yourself, um, you, you analyze and change things. And, um, you know, I can, I can, I can honestly say to you. So for, for, for example, we are now much better at knowing when to hire staff on when we first got, got into this and we'd get together for our board meetings and talk about hiring staff. We were already three months too late yeah. because it's so it's challenging that, it? to find people. Yeah. Um, we are now at a point where we're saying, okay, do you know what? Um, you know, we're in a position where you know we we know what our forecasting is like. We now need to get a few more bodies in and and uh, and train them up. Often, what we use nowadays is uh, we use an apprenticeship model because we find it really works well for us to be able to bring the right people in, a lot of enthusiasm, and then we help to sort of mold and shape them into into the right sort of staff member for ETI, so we can then drive them forward. and And we're we're very proud of the fact that we, uh, we you know we we have a hundred percent track record of hiring on the apprentices. Um, but also, what's um, what's even more encouraging is when you hear from your customers and it's a lot of your longstanding customers talking about individuals that they're talking to on the phone and things. And it, it does two things. It, it says, A, you know, we're doing a good job of training the staff up, but B, that customer is still having a really positive experience, regardless of whether they're on their first contract with us or second or third contract with us. And and it, it's, um, you know, it's, it, it's really about that customer experience. And we focus a lot of energy on that customer experience as opposed to necessarily um, the bottom line. Our, our philosophy is, is if I focus on the customer, that bottom line will get there. And we, we have a financial formula that allows us to get there, but it's about, it's about, uh, you know, the customer being in a, in a very good place and, and a very happy customer to us genuinely. Um, so that, um, you know, we, we know that, uh, um, uh, lost my train of thought there. I oh, know, don't worry. But the, uh, the, 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 yeah. the, the, the key point, isn't it, is that you've got a model, you can scale it That's and right. profit looks after itself. Yeah, absolutely. Now I've got my Canada shirt on. Today, mm. uh, specifically for you. So, but you're not actually, you were actually born in Canada, were you? 
I, I often get called a plastic Canadian, to be honest. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's uh, Simon's over in the, in the crowd, uh, giggling away, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I was born in, uh, in, in Turkey, in Devon, as you can tell by my accent, uh, and moved over when I was six and a half to, uh, to Toronto with my, uh, with my parents, uh, and spent most of my life, uh, most of my, uh, sort of younger days, formative, uh, years in Canada, um, but always had a calling to come back to the UK. And uh, I ended up coming back over to the UK when I was about 27. I'd been through for a few holidays and things uh, to to play rugby over here for uh, a very short-lived professional rugby career of, of, of all of about 14 months. And uh, what did, I mean, t- <laughs> tell me about what it was like growing up in Toronto then, because when we'll go on to the rugby, but t- tell us about Canada, tell us about Toronto. Is it, yeah. is, was it a good place to grow up? Well, it's a fantastic place to grow up. Um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was everything you hear and, and more, um, a really, um, uh, we were sort of all on the outskirts of, of Toronto. Uh, every big city has its challenges in, in, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, safety and everything else. But, um, you know, we were always in the suburbs and it was quite, uh, uh, quite a great, um, uh, upbringing really. Um, lots of, uh, you know, playing outdoors and all that sort of stuff. Um, What's the climate at, like? Is it is it kind of really cold for part of the year and then really nice for the other part? Yeah, it's really two extremes. Right. Um, so, you, so you go from, uh, um, you know, snow snowstorms up till sort of mid-April. You're always guaranteed to get a little bit of snow on the ground um, and that may change overnight. So you're then hitting sort of 20 degrees out um, and it just escalates from there up to uh, to, to above 30. So, um, so yeah, so... Bit, bit of a challenging, uh, you know, from from a climate perspective because you've got the two extremes, um, but but you do learn to learn to live with it, um, and uh, as a result, it means it's very um, outdoor oriented, sports oriented. Um, you know, so I played a lot of ice hockey when I was younger. Uh, um, again, tried my hand at, uh, at rugby a fair bit, but also uh, played a bit of American football as well and, and that sort of thing. So I'll. Uh, all, all, all good experiences. Because it, it seems to me that almost that every, it, it's such a sporty com, c- country kind because of, of course, foot, pr- pr- soccer is, is quite big there. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've mentioned rugby. Uh, they even play a bit of cricket. I know because I'm a big cricket fan. I mean, obviously, yep. the, the, the the pool of talent they've got to go for in terms of uh, the size of the population isn't as big yep. as, as some countries. But is that what it's like? What it's, like? it's a very outdoors type environment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, it's it's just such a vast country. You can just get out and, and do things. You know, hiking, uh, mountain biking, skiing, uh, skiing. Um, you know, uh, similar to the way we've got a lake district here. There's a you know, particularly in Ontario where where Toronto's based. Um, there's a massive sort of cottage country. That's is that is that Whistler? Of, uh, that's out. Um, uh, towards British Columbia. Oh, that way. okay. So further out, uh, out west, uh, which again is a is a whole different place, and it's such you know such a vast country um, that the changes as you go throughout the country are are, are you know quite uh, quite dramatic, particularly with the mountains and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. What's the situation with wildlife in Canada? Because I've always had this image of like you go out to get in your car and there's a polar bear stood outside. It is it is is is, is it could it be quite dangerous in certain regions? Um. No, I think it's 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 probably more in the press than anything else. I think I think I think the most the most I've ever had from a wildlife perspective is uh, driving into Banff uh, in the summer, so it wasn't wasn't the uh, ski season, and passing a moose on the roadside, just sort of grazing along and uh, you know doing its own thing, and you just you know you're they're up huge, and thinking, wow, aren't they? A moose yeah. is huge. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so. So, uh, you know, I've, I've heard stories of bears and, and things like that. Um, but you've never encountered people, one yourself? No. Well, as a professional rugby player, I'm sure you would have been able to deal with a bear, no problem. Do, do you mean my, my ability to run? Is that, is that <laughs> well, you, you go, just go for it. So when did you start playing rugby? Um, I, I, I started in um, comprehensive school or high school uh, over, over in Canada. Uh, uh, it, it really came down to... Um, I had, again, I played a lot of ice hockey uh, and was just going into um, high school and decided I wanted to try my hand at American football. And I went home and uh, my uh, my dad being of a sort of British background said, well, look, if, if you're going to try American football with the helmets and the pads and everything else, I want you to try rugby as well and just compare the two and see how you go. And uh, uh, so I 
fair enough, Dad. I'll you know give, give it a go. And uh, uh, and I took to both. I played both uh, throughout uh, high school. Um, but uh, just the, uh, I think it was the culture of having a drink after the game and all of that sort of stuff. You didn't necessarily get that with American football, and you got that. Um, you know, it probably wasn't it wasn't old enough at that point, but sort of as I moved on, uh, it's a social my rugby career is a lot more social over there, and uh, um, you know, got into a little bit more serious rugby. But I suppose probably when I played, it was a case of um, you know, there's still a lot more a lot more social than than some of the professionals are these days, which are very much about trying to, uh, you know, build, build their, uh, um, uh, physique and making sure they're in, you know, uh, tip top shape and everything else. It, it, you know, it, it was, uh, uh, it was a different day back then. And it was a bit more, you know, a bit more social around, uh, around the games. Um, when did you decide that you were going to try and pursue the game professionally? Um, I'd, I'd played to a pretty high standard within uh, Canada. Um, I'd played uh, uh, for the provincial team. I'd traveled all across Canada playing uh, in various national tournaments and things. Um, uh, I'd played for most of the um, uh, Canadian team age groups as I as I came along. As in the national team? As in the national team, yeah. Um, and what was, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a huge rugby fan, what a Canada one of the? I mean, I know they're not at the like the real top table, are they? Rugby, but they're yeah, pretty good standard, aren't they? They're struggling a bit at the moment. Are they? Um, uh, as, as things go through, you know, uh, various times. Um, back then, they were uh, they were much better, much stronger, um, which made the the challenge even even more difficult to try and get to the full full men's side. Um, so I'd I'd, um, I'd done reasonably well there, and uh, I was. Uh, pretty settled in a um, in, in some full time work I was doing in the, in the business environment, um, and just got a call one day and asked if I would be interested in coming across. And I thought, gosh, you got to do this. You got you got to try it. And, and who was and it who gave you a call? With? Uh, there was um, there was a scout over in uh, in Ontario who was um, looking for uh, various different players. For um, uh, I ended up playing for Rotherham over here for a season. Rotherham. Um, uh, and uh, it was just just one of their scouts that they had at the time. Uh, they had an injury. They needed to try and fill that gap pretty quickly. Um, uh, and I I fit the bill, I suppose. So I came over on a trial initially. Um, there was another uh, Canadian came along with me for for a, for a different position. Um, so it was it's quite nice to at least have somebody sure. else there that was a similar background of things. Um, and and really enjoyed the experience. Um, I, it was it was the structure of of things, um, uh, structure of the professional game at that time wasn't quite there. And I suppose, um, if if I'm honest, um, my my focal point from a rugby perspective was was probably a little bit more on the amateur side and the the um, the side of enjoying a little bit more than than what I was as, as a professional. And decided that look, you know, it's 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 probably not the right time for me to pursue this. I was, um, you know, 27. 28 and uh had 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 a solid sort of six years of working and i thought you know what it's a bit of a risk isn't it yeah, to just pursue and, and, that and so uh so i went back and um uh, got back into into business still played a lot um uh, really enjoyed it uh came back over in 2004 and played for coventry for a bit as well uh um as it um uh, more as a sideline to a business i'd opened at the time over here um uh and uh and really ran its course, played a little bit more, and then had children, and that took all your time on weekends and everything else. So it was one of those. So, uh, so I look back on it with fond memories, and, and we, you know, still support uh, a couple of local clubs to us as well. So, uh, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's done a lot for me. It's uh, allowed me to travel quite extensively, um, places like Japan and, uh, and and various you know various other places. And it must have been from a fitness perspective. You know, back in the day, you must have really had to, you know, commit to your training and 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 strength yeah. work and speed because rugby is such a you need such a diversity of skills, don't you? You've got yeah. the the strength, the speed, the tactical side, the teamwork. It always looks to me like one of the most challenging sports there is. Yeah, and I think I, I think I think you're right. Um, certainly nowadays, it's a lot more. There's a lot more science that goes behind it in terms of training regimes and everything else. I think. Um, Back when I was playing, it was um, you were kind of left to your own devices to some degree. Um, the science wasn't there yet. It, it was a case of if you, as an individual, wanted to go and train, um, you you got out of it what you 
sort of put into it really. Yeah. Um, I was lucky because I'd, I'd had a, um, quite a strong uh, work ethic from from coming from ice hockey. I played at a reasonable level with mm. ice hockey and uh, and that allowed me to sort of step into the rugby side of things and uh, and, and really carry on with that. So uh, so it's uh, overall, I suppose, um, and I think we talked we've talked about this before. Um, you know, sport is is a fantastic sort of um, um, environment for for people to sort of um, almost learning the, the the ropes when you're looking at, at trying to run a business. Um, it's all about teamwork. It's all about um, uh, leadership. It's all about being able to suppress your ego when somebody else is trying to lead. It's uh, it's about being able to uh, celebrate the wins, mm. but also, you know, celebrate the, the defeats and the learning behind that and uh, be able to recognize when, uh, you know, when, when somebody has got the better of you and, um, we were talking today and it, in fact, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think we, uh, we, we, um, uh, we're talking about the, the managers in the premiership at the moment. And, and one of the things that, uh, in football, I should mm, say, rather than rugby, yeah. um, uh, one of the things that's encouraging nowadays is you've got a, a group of managers that, um, are all for sort of sharing the successes. And if they don't feel their team's played very well or they feel somebody's played a lot better, they're not afraid to turn around and no, say, that's hey, right. do you know what? We credit got, where credit's due. We just got beat today because yeah. we didn't play as well as, yeah. as somebody else and they've had a fantastic game. And I think that's really honorable. And I think um, sport these days sort of sort of gives you that, um, it's a self-belief to have confidence in yourself, whether win or loss. And I think it's uh, it, it's great for um, you know for helping people, particularly in the business world. Be well, able I was to carry I, I was I was going to say because there's there's, there's a, a message there about learning from failure and um, being gracious in success, which I think you can take forward to the business world. I mean, it 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 always seems to me to be a bit of a cliche to talk about. You know, I, I, I'm not afraid to fail and that sort of thing. Mm. But if you if you look back at your career in business with hindsight, I personally find that some of the most valuable experiences is when things haven't gone so well. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. where, where the, the key, isn't it, is you tend when you're in business to, to put pound signs on a certain level of failure. Yeah. I, what I try to do is think, well, what will I gain in the future through the learning mm -hmm. from that experience? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Is, is, how, how do you deal with just in business when things don't go as you'd, as you'd yeah. hoped? How, how do you deal with it like emotionally and also in just in terms of your business response? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's um, a really interesting question. I, I think to some degree, um, providing that you have a uh, strong financial um, model, uh, often, um, it, it's, it's, I suppose, I suppose you go through various stages of business. The first stage of the business is, is, is often just getting going and you're, you're trying to just fight for, you know, existence, if, yeah. if, you, if you will, and, uh, not to sort of hemorrhage too much money while you're Correct. doing that. But, but I think, um, you know, once you get, once you get past that and get, get into sort of a model and a rhythm with things, it's, it's about almost doing the planning and looking beyond the finances and looking and, and yeah, there's, there's an, there's a, there's an element that makes up the profitability and the revenue and all of that sort of stuff and how much is left at the end for, for, for the business um, and uh, the expenses that go along with that. But, but quite frankly, a lot of it is about, you know, t taking away the importance of that financial element and actually just building it into a uh, a model and yeah. building it into a um, a model that uh, um, you know uh, th that you repeat and and if you are having success with something, go back to the things that are making you successful. If you are um, you know going down a down a path where you've been unsuccessful a number of times, you analyze that and review it. And did I put my best foot forward here, or should I be changing the way I do some of these things? And um, so so I think it's about being honest with yourself. Um, uh, one of the uh, one of the original uh, business partners that, that um, I started the business with, and um, uh, you know, he he always used to talk about you know, can you can you look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day and 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 say, have I have I have I done my best here? Have I put my best foot forward? Um, and often um, by communicating that message through your entire team, um, you can try and create a, a business where people are um, uh, entrepreneurial in the spirit. 
Um, yes, we don't want everybody going off on different tangents, but we all want them to have, you know, a level of responsibility engagement in the business so that um, the directionally, the direction that they're going is 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 a similar ethos to uh, um, to to the to the business itself. And I think it's um, it's just about constantly being rational and being able to review those um, uh, you know decisions that haven't necessarily gone the right way, um, and uh, and then and then celebrate when you do get it right and try and do more of those, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, but you also equally get down to a little bit of the sports side of things with the wins and losses and, and you, um, excuse me, you, you certainly do, uh, um, you know, it, it, despite the way you organize yourself and put the strategy behind things and, uh, uh, invest in the, in the decisions that you're making things, you don't always get it, get it no. right. And, and, uh, particularly when you're dealing with, um, you know, with, with customers and, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think back to, uh, opportunities that I really wanted to win. It would have been a very strategic win for us as a, as a business to bring certain clients on. Um, we didn't win it. And you look back on it and you think, do you know what? It probably wasn't the right time for us. And what can we learn from that? And, um, I suppose from our, from our perspective, um, we've got very good at being able to analyze and understand that, um, uh, and, uh, and as a result of that, get much better at, at doing things. And we recognize, um, what makes us successful. And so now what we start to do is we talk about that a lot more in terms of what makes us successful. Um, it's very difficult because you, you, um, you're, 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 you're walking that sort of tightrope between people thinking you're arrogant and, and, uh, all of that, sure. but by the same token, you're saying, well, you know, I, I, I'm not arrogant. I just. Do you know, believe in yourself very, very well? Yeah, you and, believe you believe yeah, in yourself, and so. it's it's that it's that self belief which leads to people yeah. meeting challenges. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Talking of challenges, you 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 mentioned earlier the do's and don'ts of right. uh, security and and of of of, of 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 keeping a safe, secure, agile working environment. Mm -hmm. I think the scenario that most people will be familiar with now is you either get an email or you get a text message, which is either asking you to open it or to open a link within it mm -hmm. or to perform some sort of action or to reply to or whatever it might be. I think we'll all be pretty familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And obviously the worst examples are where you're being asked for personal details and, and that sort of thing. What are the do's and don'ts of those sort of situations? And uh, obviously in doing this, you'll be showcasing what ETI Cloud do for, for clients, the advice you give them. Yeah, so, so I think um, first and foremost, um, the leadership team within an organization needs to ensure that they are setting themselves up appropriately to, to deal with the particular situations. And that's, and that's ensuring that um, any of the more sinister, obvious things are are weeded out of any sort of delivery. So, um, having a you know an email security system in place that's uh, that's pretty rock solid um, that ensures that a lot of the sinister stuff just doesn't get through. So it doesn't get through to staff, um, which is key. Um, uh, th there will also be secondary systems that say you might want to just have a look at this, but have a look at it sort of offline in a in a sandboxed environment. To, in, to ensure that it's it is what it should be and I'll let you make the decision whether you want to have that delivered or whether you want to view that and and it's important that um, staff are trained on how to use that properly so that they know what they're doing instead of just delivering things that are caught up because they they think it should be delivered. so that's like prevention it's better Correct. than cure isn't it Correct. yeah and but but then also what we're seeing is um you know, I, I sat in on a call, um, a, a meeting uh, about two weeks ago with a managing partner um, of a decent sized firm, about uh, 100, 160 staff, um, who, uh, you know, was going through uh, training. I think this was, this was probably his fifth or sixth training session he'd done over a, a number of weeks where he was actually sat with staff, either in the boardroom or connected through through a um, video conference, um, and would go through and specifically ensure all of his staff know what the company sort of policies and the company ethos is surrounding things, but also how to look for things that aren't necessarily um, normal and could be, you know, could be suspicious. Um, but also then to reassure staff that, look, 
it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to have made a mistake. But if you think you've made a mistake, let somebody yeah, know. Definitely. Because um, I think that the, the challenge we have in, an, in a sort of a blame culture at the minute is that, um, you know, people can, can feel sort of ostracized that they've made a mistake. Mm. So they just sort of bury their head in the sand, even though they might think, oh, I'm not really sure about that. Mm. What you want is you want to have that, you know, you, you want to have no a no-blame culture so that that information is coming out. Because the sooner, um, you know, the, the, um, the management team and the IT team helping them um, is aware of it, the quicker they can just double check and root out that, you know, actually you're okay. You've, you've you've not fallen victim here, so um, so so a lot of it's around communication, to be yeah. honest, and a lot of it's about buy-in from the senior management team to let staff know what 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 they should be looking for. Um, companies like us help people by doing training and, and all that sort of stuff as well, but it, but it's about giving staff confidence that even if they make a mistake, they're they're not going to be ostracized for it, and and uh, ensuring that that confidence is there throughout the team because then that makes it more of an advocate. Of, of making sure that they're looking for these things because they're not afraid to look for them now as opposed to somebody who's fearful about yeah. stumbling across these. It doesn't work, does it? No. Blame culture is just, they're, they're totally, what the, the evil they're trying to prevent, they're actually promoting. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So I think, I think to be honest, um, you know, making sure that you're having good conversations with your with your uh, IT security specialists, um, as as we were saying earlier on. But but it's about building that culture, and I think it's uh, that that's crucial to the way things work. And just making sure that people understand that, you know, for example, the whole remember that we were talking about the LinkedIn uh, photographs uh, of files on tables. That's just that's not acceptable. Um, making sure they know what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, and, and I think that's key to it. And it's so it's in a lot of cases just just common sense. Um, you know, one of the things that um, has been has been circulating on a lot of social media is is surrounding um, you know people going on Facebook and other social media and going on the quizzes and all of that and put uh, put your birth you know your birth month in. Well, that's what I was going to say. Put yeah, the year you were born and and you do get asked quite a lot, don't you? Yeah, and a lot of that is being skimmed and, and building a profile around a particular person. And um, so, and, who's and, skimming that? Is it a system or is it a, is it a person? It, it it's it's generally a system, but then that information is made available to. Uh, to people to be able to then um, uh, data mine that against other information that they've got. So they might know people's names and addresses, but now they might also be able to link their birth dates or, or their birth month and their birth year in or, you know, where they were born or... The, uh, and then they can, plan, that, they can plan other activities. That's right. So they're, yeah. they're, they're almost micromanaging your your potential yeah. as, a, as a victim of their yeah. crimes. What's what's scary is um, how how professional... Uh, some of these um, uh, criminals are yeah. in, in in their um, you know every, everything from their customer service if you pay a ransom fee in terms of how they unlock things the the payment gateways that they're able to provide people with the um, you know uh, the data mining that they're doing and, and combining the data and and uh, and building images and profiles of of individuals so they can go and target them, um, you know, and, and a lot of these you know uh, these these tactics are are being used by marketing companies um, for um, uh, in in in, uh, in normal data processing of things. The same sorts of tactics are being used by the criminal networks to be able to sort of build profiles around wow. people. So it's it's a case of um, that's what it's becoming very clever and very very scary, because, sophisticated. Yeah, um, and it's and, profitable business though, isn't it? It's worth, it's worth the investing yeah, the time. Absolutely. So it's it's a case of I think I think a lot of it stems from education, and I think it's something that um, you know we find there's probably more time needs to be spent around that area and, it, and it's it's an area that's uh, of concern for us um and, I, and again i suppose uh, we talked about the human element of things yeah we can build an absolute sort of fortress from a security perspective the challenge is is companies then want to go and have you know conversations with people through email and things of that nature and, and externalize um their, their their business for for obvious reasons um and it's it's that's where the challenge is is uh, are more prevalent in uh, uh, in the communication channels that are opened and how those are opened. Um, 
you know, one of the big areas nowadays are things like um, self-serve onboarding tools where you might have a oh, right, client sort yeah. of put all their details in so they know what they're doing. Um, and then there's automated links and uh, uh, um, multi-factor authentication to authenticate them. So they'll get a text as well as an email with a, with a link connecting to the, where they actually uh, go and look at the data. Things like that are very clever ways to ensure that um, – uh, your your client interactions are protected and secure. And that's the type of thing that, that what we're seeing. So we would sort of advise more education for staff, um, more senior level buy-in, um, discussions around the types of security products that need to be in place. Um, uh, but, but then also looking at advancements based on the business model that they're running and what, what would work for them. So, uh, um, you know, what is the right fit for them? What What is their uh, core task as a business? Yeah. Um, and then trying to help them with, with, from that regard. So. Well, it comes across and that prevention rather than cure, it seems very reasonable, particularly yeah. when you're faced with people who probably spend all day long <laughs> trying to think of increasingly sophisticated yeah. ways to get into your, your systems, but also to influence the way your people behave. Yeah, absolutely. So in... in in, in sort of one statement, in terms of what the future holds for ETI Cloud, in terms of what your goals are, Gosh, the classic, statement. where would you like to be in five years? What, what if we met again in five years? What, uh, what would you be telling me you'd you'd been up to? Um, I'd hate to sit here and tell you world domination, but it's but it's but it's a bit along the lines of world domination. Um, no, we, we in, in a, on a serious note, um, we see other markets uh, globally that um, that that, that uh, uh, our services would fit well into those marketplaces. Um, they are they are the, the, the typical marketplaces. Uh, Australia is one, uh, North America is another, um, where there are massive similarities to the way the UK market works. Um, I, I think uh, uh, there are there is plenty for us to do within the UK. Um, our reputation in the industry um, is very strong. Uh, it's taken us a, a number of years to ensure that uh, um, we have we've built our brand to that level. We have um, successfully worked with a lot of customers that like what we're doing with them. We, we're working with a lot of partners from a technology perspective, so we're sharing a lot of good ideas with our customers. We're doing a lot of good things from uh, articles and putting information out to the Law Society members. Um, so we want to do a lot more of that. Um, and, and ultimately what we want to do is ensure that we are um, – uh, we're not just turning around and saying, right, we're we're off to these other marketplaces. We have a lot to do in the UK. Um, we uh, we see the the uh, security side of our products evolving. Um, it's not going away, is it? The, the, no, this, this issue is not. I mean, either the agile working environment or the importance of security that is not going away. Yeah, we we, we see that sort of getting. Um, uh, sort of higher, wider, and deeper into the whole into the whole uh, um, workspace for for clients um, as their needs change uh, and as uh, uh, more sophisticated solutions are available um, that we're constantly reviewing and uh, looking at how they'll fit into um, uh, into our into our customers' uh, uh, business needs um, and we've um, you know we've got some really exciting stuff coming forward um, within the next few months that uh, we think is going to sort of revolutionize the marketplace um, in, in terms of what we bring to the table and how we align with our customers. And I think um, uh, companies are working different nowadays, and I think that's going to continue. So, for example, um, I was having a, having a chat today with um, an IT director about um, how they're using Teams um, versus email versus some of the other solutions that they have for interacting with staff. So, um, and you, you may find this yourself in the sense that I might have somebody send me a Teams chat and I, they, they may then send me a, a, an attachment in a Teams conversation. They might also send me an email with an attachment in it. They might also send it as a text to me or yeah. a WhatsApp to me. And we've got you know many different ways of communicating. I think a lot of that's going to start to sort of form into more of a, a corporate policy driven, yeah. right? If we're doing things and communicating, we need to communicate in this way. Consistently. So that, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of work around that as well. But I, but I think ultimately, um, you know, we're in a really good place as an organization, um, uh, not just you know, the, the pandemics only served to sort of highlight that. 
Um, but we uh, we're kind of going from strength to strength, and we're we're looking to really try and uh, try and b- build the brand into into a, into a lot more um, uh, a lot more things for for a lot more um, firms. Yeah. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you. Um, it's not hard at all to see why. It, it, this area that ETI cl- Cloud focus on is so important. Mm. And, and frankly, if businesses aren't investing in these areas, then they're at risk. Yeah. And yeah. And, the, and the benefit of saving what is, you know, not a huge business changing investment mm. um, just doesn't stack up. So look, I mean, we, we, we've worked with you guys in our group for, for some time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we recommend you with confidence all the time and certainly having... Uh, enjoyed your company today, Jonathan. I won't hesitate to continue with that recommendation. So good luck to you. Good luck to all, all your other leaders in your business. Okay. And it'd be great to talk again sometime. Yeah, super. Well, thanks ever so much for having me today. Really good man. It. Cheers. Enjoyed it. That was awesome. Very good. That was great. <laughs> <laughs>